As our nation continues to grapple with its legacy of systemic racism, this Shabbat we observe an important remembrance. And it couldn't be more appropriate that we do so as a congregation of congregations, demonstrating a unity that transcends any one congregation alone. Sunday, June 19th, Juneteenth, marks the 157th anniversary of General Gordon Granger's declaration in Galveston that the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights. His announcement came, of course, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Then and ever since, the message of liberty and equality has traveled far too slowly across the land. Two summers ago, as COVID was gripping America, so was a long overdue reckoning with racism past and present. First, we witnessed the disproportionate suffering of black and brown Americans from the virus's impacts, which should have come as no surprise given the enduring gaps in housing, education, and health care. And then came the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, next the police shooting of Jacob Blake seven times in the back, and the killings of Breonna Taylor, Daniel Prude, Stephen Taylor, George Floyd, and the list hasn't stopped. So neither can our vigilance and our commitment to the cause of racial justice. Just because other critical concerns now occupy the headlines, like the war in Ukraine, inflation, and January 6th, doesn't mean we can take our eyes off that goal. The reckoning isn't over. Rather, we must retrain our eyes to see the distress of black Americans we had somehow failed to acknowledge. Let us not depart this sanctuary into a summer of moral slumber. Rather, let the summer of George Floyd, that will be Mr. Williams' theme tonight, rather let that summer and all we learned about the tasks still before us as a nation continue to move us to do better and be better. Thomas Chatterton Williams is the author of two memoirs, Losing My Cool, How a Father's Love and 15,000 Books Beat Hip Hop Culture, published in 2010, and Self-Portrait in Black and White, Unlearning Race, published in 2019, the year he was also a New America National Fellow. In 2020, Mr. Williams helped write and organize a letter on justice and open debate signed by 153 leading public figures published in Harper's Magazine and reprinted around the world defending free speech at a time of growing censorship. The 2022 Guggenheim Fellow and recipient of the Berlin Prize from the American Academy in Berlin, Mr. Williams is currently a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He is also a visiting professor of the humanities and senior fellow at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College and a contributing writer at The Atlantic. Previously, a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine and a columnist at Harper's, his work has appeared in The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, Le Monde, The Wall Street Journal, and many other publications too. And it has been collected in the best American essays and the best American travel writing. His next book, Nothing Was the Same, The Pandemic Summer of George Floyd and the Shift in Western Consciousness will be published soon, and that will be his subject tonight. So please join me in welcoming Thomas Chatterton Williams. Hello, good night. 
Thank you um, so much for having me here. What an incredible space, and what an honor it is to be here with you and to share your, your service, so I uh, thank you. Um, it's really an extraordinary turn of events for me that, uh, that the nation has um, recently decided to recognize Juneteenth. Um, growing up in New Jersey in the 80s and 90s, um, Juneteenth was not something that very many, if any, people I knew uh, spoke about or I think even knew about, um, but it was, a, it was a moment in the year of, of some profound meaning in my own home because um, I'm the son of a man who was raised in Galveston, Texas, and my father uh, is really old enough to be my grandfather. And his grandmother was married to a man who was born in the year 1865, um, in that year of emancipation that came uh, two and a half years uh, later um, in Galveston than it did anywhere else in the country. And I often um, would think about what his parents must have thought when they imagined this new world that their baby might inhabit. And I was always profoundly aware that I inhabited a different country than my father had grown up in. And it was a valuable lesson for me that um, things can and do sometimes change for the better. But events alone don't uh, dictate progress. It's, it's a matter of, it's always a matter of what we uh, make of the events that we um, have the chance of living through. And so I want to speak tonight about more recent events that I think um, are very pivotal in the development of our country's uh, racial collective consciousness. Like the assassination of JFK or the events of September 11th, for the rest of our lives, we're going to remember exactly where we were the moment we first watched it. For me, it was a Tuesday afternoon in the rural west of France where we'd gone into quarantine seven weeks prior. By that point, days were indistinguishable, but the sheer repetitiveness of the new reality had months ago ceased to be a nuisance and had shifted instead into something like reassurance. It had been unseasonably sunny the whole of confinement. I spent the morning exercising and reading, aware of my luck to be able to work remotely. In many ways, it was a healthier existence than the one we'd left behind in Paris. After clearing the family lunch from the table, I heard the children's voices in the yard as I took my coffee up to my borrowed office. I don't know when the habit would have solidified a few years prior, but the new normal meant that I went not to my email or the homepage of the New York Times, but straight to Twitter. A post from CBS News at 1.21 p.m. my time snapped me from the mild solipsism of confinement. Video shows Minneapolis cop with neon neck of motionless moaning man read the text above an astonishing image. Within the numbing flood of bad news and stress that is the lifeblood of social media, and at a juncture in an appalling campaign when the President of the United States had spent the Memorial Day weekend attacking the physical appearances of various female opponents, a time when the US death toll from the novel coronavirus was fast closing in on the symbolic, previously unthinkable, and in retrospect, min minuscule, 100,000 mark. This picture was orders of magnitude more upsetting. If it wasn't clear on that first agonizing click, it became so within the hours and days that followed. For America, and indeed for large swaths of the world, it was the visual quintessence of a centuries-long and cancerous history, a tortured transatlantic oppression rendered in flesh and pixels. From that moment on, there would be two George Floyds, related but not identical, and it has become necessary to separate them. On the one hand, there was the son of the, and the brother, certainly down on his luck that long weekend, unemployed and carrying methamphetamines and fentanyl in his system. This man was in a bad way when law enforcement encountered him, perched on a parked car, having passed a counterfeit banknote moments earlier, a petty crime that even the cashier seemed embarrassed to have reported. This George Floyd had survived an early bout of COVID-19, only to be asphyxiated in broad daylight by an officer he'd once worked side by side with. That mortal man's biography, his early life as an aspiring rapper in Houston, his childhood friendship with the basketball star Steven Jackson, and his practically unmentionable criminal career as someone who had allowed himself to rob a pregnant woman at gunpoint, fixed him in a specific time and place within the very real, painful, and transformative discourse 
around systemic poverty and racism, crime and punishment, Black Lives Matter, police violence, the limitations of the first black presidency, and its immediate succession by what has been ruefully termed the first white presidency. On the other hand, there's the immortal footage of George Floyd's death throes that exists on wretched loop in our brains and can be instantaneously conjured on our screens as a discrete and profoundly shareable cultural unit. This latter technological aspect, informed by but also divorced from and transcending in its particular subject, cannot be overstated. A meme, as Richard Dawkins defined it, is an idea, behavior, or style that spreads by viral process. The truth is that people seldom have ideas, but ideas and the intimations of such, their pre-rational moods and gestures, very certainly have people. They are contagious, ripping through populations that are sometimes asymptomatic until there is a further mutation. None of this is to say that they are necessarily sinister, they simply inhabit us at different times and places, individually and collectively, like personalities. Whether they are good or bad, or neutral or some hybrid of the two, is clear only in retrospect, after their course has been exhausted. In the moment, emotion and solidarity can blind us as well as ennoble us. With distance, we may now begin to ask ourselves questions. What exactly did we see in that video? Or perhaps more to the point, what is the seminal meme in the Western tradition which this video so powerfully tapped into? As America began to wake up and I left my desk and returned to it in the saddening spectacle in Minneapolis, as the nation's grief and fury began to concentrate around a Midwestern Golgotha, the Christ-like dimensions of that horizontal crucifixion started to take root in the subconscious. Had Floyd not, in some viscerally apparent way, borne the awful weight of the society's racial sins on his very neck and shoulders? And had that weight, all of ours, taken together, not in turn crushed him? A man died for us on that squalid pavement, asking not why his father had forsaken him, but shatteringly calling for his deceased mother. The lethargic executioner, solely on the authority that we grant him and resigned to a haunting impassiveness, had washed his hands of the matter, had buried them deep inside his pockets. Paradigm shifts occur much the same way Hemingway described going broke, gradually then suddenly. All of us rely on mental frameworks to make the world legible until, from one moment to the next, they suddenly fail to do so. The death of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, touched on every single aspect of our public lives and much of our private ones as well. During the season of rebellion and reckoning that followed, <clears throat> nearly 8,000 Black Lives Matter demonstrations took place across the nation, not to mention the mass protests that erupted internationally in places as far away as Paris, Amsterdam, London, Seoul, Taiwan, and even Finland. All told, millions of people rose up worldwide, disgusted by what they saw <clears throat> excuse me, in mind-boggling unison. It is no exaggeration to say that these were the largest manifestations against racism in the history of humanity. Why did this happen? Why now and not on any number of previous occasions? Why did the reaction transcend national boundaries? Why to cite just one of countless such examples were students at Oxford University in the United Kingdom suddenly granted special consideration in their final exams solely because of this American event? In 2014, we watched in disbelief as Officer Daniel Pantaleo dragged Eric Garner to the Staten Island sidewalk for the crime of peddling loose cigarettes, compressing his wind windpipe beneath his forearm. That was when we first heard the wrenching phrase, I can't breathe, that Floyd would echo in Minneapolis and that protesters in Paris would learn to chant in English. It soon became a t-shirt that LeBron James could warm up in, a pithy slogan. We applauded his consciousness and were troubled by the footage, but unbridled outrage remained limited and sporadic. Two years later, when Philando Castile bled out on Facebook Live, we felt sickened. He'd not done anything wrong, in fact, he'd done just about everything right. Announcing up front that he was carrying a licensed firearm, it was difficult to fathom why he'd been stopped some 52 times 
prior to that fatal encounter. Still, our lives remained busy and we resumed them. By May of 2020, however, stuck in our houses and clasping our screens while the world outside our windows took on ever more menacing dimensions, a recording of a fatal confrontation in Georgia held our attention. What happened to Ahmed Arbery looked strikingly, anachronistically, like a lynching. A lynching that had been covered up for months, much like the news of a young medic named Breonna Taylor, woken from her sleep and shot to death by police in Kentucky. All of this and more began to form a context. Quote, to draw, to draw momentous conclusions from a single video shot on the sidewalks of Minneapolis might seem excessive, Paul Berman wrote in Liberties. Yet that is how it is with the historic moments of overnight political conversion. There were four million slaves in 1854, but the arrest of a single one proved to be the incendiary event. For a not insignificant portion of the American left and center, and also some on the right, who were sidelined from normal life, homeschooling and working remotely, or panicking about not working, and who were being antagonized into a near constant state of anxiety by a singularly polarizing president, who seemed not only not to grasp the severity of the pandemic, but even to rejoice in tempting catastrophe, as he had after Charlottesville, come to think of it. The possibility that the country had a malignant racial sickness began to seem undeniable. Many of these people understood themselves to be white and were newly alive to their own physical and spiritual vulnerability, but also freshly aware of the disproportionate toll that COVID-19 had been taking on other communities. That discrepancy, a consistent theme in the mainstream media's coverage in those early weeks and months, seemed to suggest problems of a more systemic nature. In the ghoulish and farcical figure of Donald Trump, and in the unfolding epidemiological scandal, many of these same people could see for themselves with sudden and blinding clarity the way that they too had been and were continuing to be lied to about the sturdiness of their institutions, about the professionalism and objectivity of their law enforcement agents and political leaders, about the general state of social progress in their society. They could intuit what was happening to people like George Floyd more clearly now, in large part because of the simple fact that they were seeing what was happening to themselves and others like them in the eerie new half-light of the pandemic. Perhaps more significantly, as commentators have pointed out since the advent of the Black Lives Matter movement, following the deaths of Trayvon Martin in 2013, and especially Michael Brown in the year after, there has been some, for some time now the heat of religious fervor beneath our secular social justice rhetoric. In particular, the all-encompassing original sin of whiteness has taken hold in the popular imagination. By the end of May 2020, an enormous number of Americans had been staring at their smartphones and televisions and computers in quarantine as fellow citizens who could not afford to stop working braved the contagion and delivered their groceries and other necessities, as well as more frivolous packages. A great many of the latter group, of course, peering out from surgical masks that half concealed black and brown faces. Many of the Americans with a sudden surplus of time to reflect on themselves became unusually collectively alive to the possibility that they too were implicated in the, in, in the entire constellation of processes and implicit biases that could allow a madman to gamble with the health of the body politic with the same startling lack of concern that a policeman could evince while chicken-winging a handcuffed, writhing civilian. This was an extraordinary, not at all inevitable conclusion for so many to arrive at so swiftly, but one that didn't come from nowhere either. Of course, there were signs of expanding fracture beforehand. On the left, significant numbers of mostly white millennials saddled with student loan debt and entering a contracting job market had found themselves newly radicalized by the Great Recession of 2008 and the disorganized, short-lived, but galvanizing Occupy Wall Street movement that sprang up in response to it. This unprecedentedly educated cohort, emblematic of Peter Turchin's uh, The Overproduction of Elites, began to rethink some of the central tenets of late capitalism and to register views that were more proving of social democracy and even Marxism than the country had seen in generations.
Though the US would spend the first two decades of the 21st century enmeshed in far-flung wars, the realities of an all-volunteer military, essentially an undereducated mercenary underclass, meant that these relatively privileged Americans were divorced from the burdens and sacrifices of service that previous generations had been forced to shoulder. For non-whites, even though the mixed race population has become the fastest growing segment of the American demos, and in real terms, a disproportionate and statistically minuscule and decreasing number of unarmed black civilians were killed by police and vigilantes annually, about 250 per year from a population exceeding 40 million. And indeed, other quality of life markers have been rising steadily since the civil rights movement. The death of Martin followed by Brown, regardless of the specific facts of that case, and a high profile slate of videotaped police and vigilante killings that converged with the proliferation of camera equipped smartphones and the pervasiveness of social media thwarted any self-congratulatory sense of inevitability of social progress still alive in the first half of Obama's administration. In both instances then, what stood out was a revolution of rising expectations that seemed at least in part to have played a decisive role in the blooming discontent that has metastasized throughout the entirety of the Trump era and especially during the pandemic year of 2020. As far back as 1856, however, Alexis de Tocqueville observed that unfulfilled rising expectations create unstable political situations. This explains why, for example, the strongholds of the French Revolution were in regions where standards of living had been improving, not the reverse. It is not always by going from bad to worse that a society falls into a revolution, Tocqueville wrote in The Ancient Regime and The, Re and the Revolution. It happens most often that a people which has supported without complaint, as if they were not felt the most oppressive laws, violently throws them off as soon as their weight is lightened. On the right side of the political spectrum, even as liberals lamented the supposed intractability of structural racism, classism, and patriarchy, the sheer symbolic power of witnessing an elegant black family inhabit the White House, an event that to some people's chagrin seriously undermined the claim that the nation was irredeemably white supremacist, seems to have driven a not insignificant segment of the population to despair and to seek a crude but effective populist champion in the figure of Donald Trump to avenge that loss of status. Here too, however, the angriest and most organized among them were not the white poor, the downtrodden increasingly given to what sociologists have dubbed deaths of despair induced by hopelessness mingled with too easy access to guns, opioids, and alcohol. But rather the middle classes, whose fortunes may not have been declining in real term, indeed may have actually been rising, but were declining in relation to other groups historically perceived as inferior and increasingly seeking recognition. By the time the world ground to a halt that summer, there had been a long festering multifaceted need a need felt in multiple previously estranged corners of the American and global polity to revolt against something. And no matter how high the frustrations piled or how unacceptable the trade-offs seemed, during what was incessantly billed as the most important election year in the, in the history of the US, in a certain feverishly persuasive telling, the single event that would fundamentally determine whether the nation itself would remain a democracy or would slide in, into, into genuine fascism, it remained politically unrespectable to rebel against stay-at-home orders or any of the other hastily conceived, contradict sometimes contradictory new restrictions, the rejection of which had become irredeemably linked with Trump and his supporters. The latter's very reluctance to prioritize a flattened curve at a moment when the left of center mainstream had coalesced around a narrative of COVID-19 as a racially discerning, quote, black plague, as a New Yorker essay at the time labeled it, opened a new and volatile front in the cold civil, civil war of intra-white status jockeying. It created an opportunity for those who see themselves as, for lack of a term, a lack of a better term, upper whites, as Raihan Salam has phrased it, to disaffiliate themselves from those they deemed lower whites. At the end of April, for example, when the state of Georgia moved in, to end its lockdown, The Atlantic ran an article with the extraordinary headline, Georgia's Experiment in Human Sacrifice. This in turn made it necessary to suppress dispassionate scientific 
probability and objective truth in favor, in favor of emotional, bitterly par partisan politics. And so what has started understandably and even nobly as regard for specific communities with racially correlated but multifaceted vulnerabilities, dense living conditions, high rates of comorbidities, disproportionate representation in fields that were designated essential work, lack of quality health care, and not insignificantly distrust of medical institutions, this would soon give way to something intensely different, a full-blown moral panic that two years later is it is possible to say with no exaggeration has touched on every facet of our collective mediated existence. This collective and rapidly evolving cognitive reality, whose origins I've tried to briefly sketch out here, which now envelops the western parts of the globe, is a fait accompli. And in many ways it's a dis distorting and polarizing one at that. But that does not mean we're powerless against it. Just as we must return to core tenets of the open society and rejecting even short-term advantageous authoritarian impulses, we must also return to our fundamental political unit, which has always been the family. So many of our seemingly most intractable problems arise in no small part from having learned to see and understand ourselves as part of overwhelming monolithic abstractions, whether it be color, sex, gender, race, religion mistaking our own interests for the purported ends of the identity we've been arbitrarily assigned to. This is true across the political spectrum, whether the identity politics of the left or the spiteful population that, populism that sometimes manifests on the right. And it is a fact that it is rooted in the exploit, exploitative invention of whiteness, which in turn necessitated blackness through the collision of Africa and Europe and the institution of slavery. But we are never going to transcend the racism this historical oppression conjured by reinforcing those same categories it both establishes and continues to feed on. The way forward begins by stepping out of the rhetorical, out of the abstract, out of the strictly historical, and into the specificity of the present and what we directly control. Without a doubt, social institutions matter. We need concrete policies, we need police reform, a floor of universal dignity that expands ac access to healthcare, daycare, and quality public education. I believe that one of the most important and potentially transformative practical arguments to gain traction in recent years has been the case for reparations for descendants of Jim Crow. And that is something we should all keep highlighted in our minds when we contemplate the lasting significance of Juneteenth. What has become most clear to me since the publication in 2019 of, of my last book, Self-Portrait in Black and White, a philosophical and, and moral first-person essay against race, is that a full imaginative healing remains improbable so long as people continue to live on such unequal terms. And so long as material conditions, no matter how persuasively, are expressed and un understood primarily through the limiting language of race. This brings me back to the dimension of the reckoning that remains so conspicuously under-articulated, or even when it is discussed by anti-identitarian leftists such as Adolf Reed or Bernie Sanders, it gets shouted down and dismissed which is the simple fact that George Floyd was a poor man. That was the most salient fact about his life. Reparations not for race, not for some ambient transnational state of blackness, but for a specific community of people and their descendants in the United States who can be shown to have been, been harmed by specific policies and practices are not without enormous risk and potential for political blowback. But if conceived and executed properly and combined with other programs and initiatives that lift all Americans stuck on the bottom rungs, they could help close the ignominious wealth gap that does more than anything else to prevent people from meeting each other as equals. But even such an ambitious effort as that would not solve everything. How could it? The fundamental political unit going back to Aristotle remains the family. That is the foundation upon which the health of the community whether heterogeneous or homogeneous, is structured. And there's no getting around this. At this moment when our focus has so powerfully shifted to the macro level, to the institutions and systems and invisible structures, the truth is that the reality on the micro level is unequal too. So long as we are free, there will always be gaps, some of them crucial, that the state is powerless to close. It has been disastrous for the left to cede this realm of the political to conservatives who so often invoke the family cynically, but invoke it nonetheless. Reparations, healthcare, childcare, high quality public school options, these are valuable goods not in themselves, but only insofar as they are tools for real families to flourish.
The summer of 2020 changed us. Like the Trump presidency, of which it marked the shameful finale, it's changed us in deep and complicated ways that are still unfolding. We couldn't return to the honeymoon phase of the Obama era, era if we wanted to, and I suspect that the overwhelming majority of us, knowing what we know now, wouldn't wish to. So far, the changes have been disorienting and painful, above all, chaotic. But there's opportunity in chaos, an investment in real community, as opposed to virtual, national, and global-level pseudo-communities, will be paramount, as will genuine integration, not as stereotypes or avatars of broad social categories, but as flesh-and-blood individuals in all of our fullness and contradiction. The spectacle of the death of George Floyd and the stasis of the pandemic have provided an unusually sustained interest in national and even international renewal and betterment. This is a potential good that carries with it one terrible danger, that in our zest to correct these undeniable and manifold wrongs we've become newly attuned to, we may exacerbate them in the process or introduce even worse dynamics. For it is no victory at all simply to lose in a more equitable manner. Thank you. Well, it looks like it might be a hard road But I'm gonna walk it with you And it looks like it might be a heavy load But I can carry some too I will lift you up when they push you down I will raise my voice and stand my ground Well, it looks like it might be a hard road But I'm gonna walk it with you And it looks like it might be a long night But I ain't going nowhere And I know it's gonna be a hard fight But I will stay right here I will shine a light in the darkest hour. I will face the man in the tallest tower where it looks like it might be a long night, but I ain't going nowhere. I will work. I will find. I will strive in the name of love. Sing it to the skies above Well, it looks like it might be a perilous climb But I will follow your lead And I know it might be a long time Until the last one of us is free But I will hold on tight Stay by your side I will be with you for this whole damn ride Well, it looks like it might be a perilous climb But I will follow your lead Well, it looks like it might be a hard road But I'm gonna walk it with you and I know you might have a heavy load But I can carry some too I will lift you up when they push you down I will raise my voice and stand my ground Well, it looks like it might be a hard road 
But I'm going to walk you with you, that's right. I'm going to walk you with you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to walk you with you. I will walk. I will climb. Shine a light the whole night through. Because it looks like it might be a hard road. But I'm going to walk you with you.